Jerusalem has been destroyed, the temple is crushed, and the Israelites, they find themselves in this place called Babylon. We see that there's four friends, Daniel and three other friends, who are are being called into worshiping God and, and serving God and God alone, Yahweh. And what we see here in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 and 2, we see that Daniel and his friends, they, they've been taken into this captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king, he's ordering everybody to start to do the things that Babylon calls them to do. We want you to put away the, the old traditions. We want you to put away your religions. We want you to put away Yahweh. We want you to put on our clothes. We want you to eat our foods. And here Daniel and his three friends and all of the Israelites who are finding themselves in the exile are, are starting to question what's going on. They're, they're living in this new town, this new place. And they're confused and they're hurt. And they don't know what to do. In chapter 1, we see Daniel and his friends, they, they estimated around 15 years old or so, and here they are, they're wise, they're capable. They're part of this group that's been held into captivity, and they're, they're um, being recruited to, to serve in the king's court. They're being offered food and clothes and, and new names. Their Jewish identity is being taken away from them, but they refuse to do what King Nebuchadnezzar has told them to do. They stand up. And they remain faithful to God. In chapter 2, as you look in chapter 2, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar, the most evil king that we've seen so far, he's ruling the land. He's actually ruling the entire world. And this, this king, he has a dream. And in this dream, he's confused, he's scared, he's troubled. It's deeply troubling him. And, and so he calls together the astrologers and the, the, the wise men. He calls them all together and he says, listen, you guys need to tell me what this dream's all about. And if you can't, I'm going to rip your limb from limb and we're going to chop off your head and you're going to be dead. Yikes, right? That's intense. And here we see Daniel taking a stand and he's saying, listen, king, uh, let me approach you. Let me come into your room. I, I know that my life is in danger. But let me come into your authority for just a moment and explain to you through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, what your, king, what your, what your dream means. And Daniel and his friends, through this moment of, of living in, in, in without fear, approaches the king and Daniel and his friends and the others, they were saved from the king. Their life was spared. And in fact, what the word tells us is that Daniel and his friends, where they were elevated to a place of power, And so now we're going to pick up in Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to see what's taking place here. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. If you have your Bibles and your phones, would you read it with me? King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all of the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Most scholars believe that this is probably 20 or 30 years past that first initial dream, right? So we saw that Daniel and his friends, they were 15 years old or so when they were taken into captivity. 20 to 30 years past this, so they're like middle-aged men. And here they are being held as captives in exile, serving the king, And 20 to 30 years later, King Nebuchadnezzar, he finally has this golden statue of himself and it's made and it's done and they're going to have this huge party. I'm a visual learner, so I brought this stuff with me. Nine feet wide for the statue. This is three feet, three, six, nine, nine feet, three of these things, nine feet wide. And uh, Michael, can you come help me real quick? Because I need to see this. You take this half because I can't count very well. And you start walking that way and I'll hold on to this right here. We're going to 90 feet. You might have to go over the sound booth. Whoa, watch your head. (laughs) 90 90 feet. Almost there. Keep going. Keep going. Keep, we're going to run out of space. We're out of space. I'll go this way. We there yet? 90 feet? We're there? That's 90 feet! Holy guacamole. Nine feet wide. 
90 feet tall, a golden statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. It took him 20 to 30 years to build. And here's what's taking place. You can just let that drop right to the ground. Here's what's taking place. The king, he's having a party. He's throwing this this party. Everyone is there. He's invited everybody to be able to experience this 90 foot tall statue, completely made of gold, nine feet wide. The king is throwing a party. He's inviting everyone there. It's loud. It's expensive. And this is an exciting day for, for most people. Right? Because here's a 90 foot tall statue. Everybody can see it. There's, there's music. There's bands. There's a, a party taking place. And most people are excited, and we've been asking the question for ourselves throughout this entire series, how do you live a godly life when culture changes? I think this is the moment that, that we see the three friends living in, right? The community is excited. There's some other Israelites or Jewish men and women who have, who have picked up their pillows and they've just laid down and they said, whatever, king, just have your way. And there's some people that have probably picked up their pitchforks and, and are fighting the king and saying, no way, this can't happen. But in this moment, 20, 30 years later, after they've been taken into exile, they're seeing this huge statue from all around the land, nine feet wide, 90 feet tall, golden. And right now it's in a... And it's in a uh, party atmosphere and here's these three Jewish men and they're thinking to themselves in this new culture I don't agree with what what's being built here I don't I don't agree with this golden idol this statue they don't want to participate in the in the party that's taking place let's continue Daniel chapter 3 verse 4 Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's 90-foot golden statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the burning furnace. You see, this is an, an intense moment. Again, we, we've seen the King Nebuchadnezzar. We've seen how evil he is. We, we've seen him threaten ripping limbs off. We've seen him threaten with, with killing people. And now he's threatening with, with, if you don't bow down to my 90-foot tall statue that everybody can see as soon as the music plays, you're going to be thrown into a blazing furnace. This, this is a torture device meant to hurt and to harm. And you can... You can choose here in a moment. You can choose to pick up your pitchfork and fight, or you can choose to pick up your pillow and, and kneel down. And here are these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are having this choice. How do I continue to serve God in this culture I'm finding myself in? King Nebuchadnezzar is saying, forget about everything you've been taught. Forget about the, the generation after generations of the things that you've heard and the, the things that you've been taught. And, and forget about this Yahweh. Forget about God. Turn your back on God or be thrown into the furnace. Daniel chapter 3, verse 7. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 8. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed of the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a, issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the golden statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. I, I found this part interesting, especially by looking back at chapter 2, the astrologers, some of those astrologers. If we go back into chapter 2, we saw that at that, at that moment when ki the king had his dream and he called in the astrologers and the sorcerers and the wizards and, and the, the, the wise men, when they called these people in to be able to interpret the, deems, the, the dreams, those astrologers were there. But only Daniel was the one that, through the power of God, could interpret the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm wondering if these astrologers who are now telling on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is going up to the king and saying, hey, king, uh, there's three guys. They're not doing what you've asked them to do. I'm wondering if these astrologers are, are, are falling into the culture of compromise. They, their life was spared when Daniel interpreted that dream, dream through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God. I'm wondering if these, these astrologers are falling into this temptation, this evil culture. They're, they're compromising and saying, listen, we don't want Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be elevated above us, and so we're going to go tell on them. We're going to see what happens. Just jealousy is taking over. And so these astrologers, they go and they tell on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 11. The, 
decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. You see, the, these three friends, they're, they're defying the orders that the king set up of bowing down to this golden statue that was there. This is an act of treason, these three men. This is, this is an act of, of, I'm not going to do what the king is telling me to do. In fact, this act of treason, it's punishable by death through the blazing furnace, a torture device, burned alive. And so these three men, they refuse to obey the king. I, I believe as I was reading through this, I believe as, as they were looking at that golden statue, I, I, I believe that they were thinking in their minds, what did my fathers and my grandfathers and the generation and the generation before me, what did they teach me? You see, I, I believe that these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I believe that they understood their relationship with Yahweh, God. And they were willing to stand up for God through anything. If they look back at the generations and the generations, they, they come to this moment where Moses was on a mountainside and, and God gave Moses these Ten Commandments. He's actually summarizing the 613 laws that these Jewish people were supposed to be following. These commandments found in Exodus chapter 20, they're going to be on the screen. They were given to Moses and the Israelites to have a better relationship with God and to have a better relationship with others. And so they're looking at these commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Yahweh is their God. And they will worship God and God alone. He is their only authority. You shall not make any for yourself an idol. They're standing here looking at this nine foot wide, 90 foot tall golden statue of King Nebuchadnezzar and they're thinking, no way. This is not what I've been taught. This is not what I've been hearing. This is not what I believe that's going to be honoring to Yahweh God. I will not bow down to that idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. You remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. You see these, these first four commandments, this is how we're supposed to be living a holy life with God. And they're seeing this and they're understanding this. And these Jewish men, they're saying, no way. Kill me first. Put me to death. Throw me in that blazing furnace if you must. But I'm here to glorify and honor God. Wow. I, I wish my life, honestly, I wish my life could be like that sometimes, right? <laughs> that when I'm facing an idol in my life that I have put there even sometimes myself, that as I'm facing that, I'll say, no way. You are not my God. I will not have anything else before God. Christ followers, there's going to be these times of, of pressure for us to conform to Babylon today. There's going to be a time for us as Christ followers where we're going to have idols or golden statues or other gods before us today. And many of us in those moments are going to live in fear. We're going to live in fear of man. We're going to live in fear of rejection or maybe being different than the people around us. We're, we're going to live in fear of maybe being called out, live in fear of conflict. I think the culture of compromise is a very powerful thing. And many of us as Christ followers, have put in that moment of there's an idol or a God before us and we pick up our pillow and we lay down because we're not willing to stand up. Wow. So how do you live a godly life when culture changes? For most of us here that are in this room or if you're watching online, I, I believe that as I look around this room, I know most of you, I know a lot of you, and, and most of you have lived with Jesus or, or following Jesus for a very long time. You know what it means to honor God. And yet, sometimes we still feel ourselves in this pressures to conform. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when everybody else was kneeling. Could you imagine that moment? Could you feel that, that fear? Can, can you put yourself in that setting where everybody else is bowing down and here's three men just simply standing? They didn't fall to the culture of compromise and they didn't fall into the temptations that were around them. 
college students, youth kids. Yikes, right? The culture of compromise that you're finding yourselves in today is, is so much more than I've found myself in. Wow. So I'm going to give you some statistics here in just a moment. And I've spent a lot of time praying this week, asking that the Holy Spirit would speak through me through this moment. I've been praying a lot this week and asking that the, the Holy Spirit would just open up our hearts and our minds to these statistics that I'm about to read. This is including me as a parent and as a spiritual leader. That when we hear these statistics, we're not going to get angry. We're not going to be confrontational. It's simply for us to respond in godly wisdom. Here we go. The PewResearch.com, they said that CDC reported 629,800... Baby is murdered. Wow. Listen to me. As I show you some of these statistics, and as we feel the emotions raging inside of us, I don't know who's watching online, and I don't know who's sitting in this room. And as I speak through these statistics, and I, and I start to tell you some of these statistics, like 629,898 abortions in 2020, I don't know where you're at. And I don't know if you've been in a moment like this. But I do know that God is so powerful. And I do know that God can and will forgive you. So as I start reading some of these statistics, please know I'm sharing this with love through the power of the Holy Spirit and that God can change and forgive your heart. And I tell you this simply for us to understand the Babylon that we're living in today. We saw the biggest amount, the highest amount, go back please. We saw the highest amount of abortions between 1980 and 1990. And we slowly started seeing this decline of abortions until 2020. We've seen a spike. We've seen a spike of abortions take place. And I believe this leads us into this next thing, this next statistic Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance and National Library of Medicine, they said this, 50% of all high school students are sexually active and almost 70% will experience intercourse by the age of 18. Wow. The average, child, the average age of a child, the first time they see internet pornography is 11 years old. This is from 2020. Do we see a correspondence in this? I don't know. When we look at statistics, we see that the number of abortions that are taking place are my age people. Do we see a correspondence in this because we're becoming addicted to sexual activity and internet pornography as kids? We're not understanding life. We're not understanding this Babylon. I don't know. Look at this slide from Youth First. It may be hard to read. I'll try to read it for you. I uh, copied this right from the uh, Youth First. It says this. Youth that view pornography once a month or more are at greater risk of developing depression, anxiety, sexual permiss permissivity, preoccupation with sex, Inability to distinguish between fantasy and reality. Unrealistic ideas about sexual relationships. Insecurities about body image and females and insecurities about sexual performance in males. As an adult, they are more likely to be unfaithful to their spouse. 56% of divorce cases involve one party having obsessive internet and online pornography. With the increase of internet pornography and pornography addictions, there has been an increase in violent sex crimes, an increase in child pornography, and sex trafficking in, is at an all-time high. 
Wow. This is the Babylon we're living in. This is the Babylon that, that my kids are living in. This is the Babylon that our youth are living in. This is the Babylon that our, our college kids are experiencing every single day. And when I see that number of 50% of, of students by the age of 18, 70 by the age of 70% by the age of 18 have experienced sexual intercourse. Wow. Do you see the few that are standing up and saying, I'm not going to fall into the golden idol or the temptations in the world around me? Wow. Enough.org says this. The pornography industry generates $12 billion in ad- annual revenue. $12 billion. That's not 11-year-olds paying for that. That's adults, us. I'm sure people sitting in this room watching online who are paying $12 billion in annual revenue. It's hard for me to stand up here and to talk about how we're killing babies and not be willing to talk about the sexual sins we're finding ourselves in. They go together. And listen to me. I'm saying this in the, the, love, the love-driven way that I possibly can. I, I'm willing to have these hard conversations with you and you online because I love the church. But we're doing it wrong. And we've been doing it wrong for a while. As a father and as a spiritual leader, I am pro abstinence. We would have a lot less issues with the statistics that I just talked about if we followed biblical law, the guidance that God gave us that there's no sex between a man and wife before they're joined together in marriage. but we're not willing to talk about that. And we're not, ex- we're not willing to have those conversations with our students and with our kids and our 11-year-olds who are experiencing pornography for the first time. Why? Why, as adults, are we not willing to be the few that stand up and say it's wrong? Why as adults are we not willing, why as as the church are we not willing to go into these uncomfortable moments with our kids and our students? And listen, I I don't say these things to cause controversy. I'm simply trying to inform you the Babylon that we're living in today. This leads us into childrendefense.org. Look at this. 1,909 children are arrested each day in the U.S. 1,909 children are arrested each day in the United States. Why? Where are we parents? Where are we guardians? Where are we grandparents? Where are we church? Worldpopulationreview.com says this, in the United States, about 50% of married couples divorce, the sixth highest divorce rate in the world. Subsequent marriages have an even higher divorce rate. 60% of second marriages end in divorce, and 73% of all third marriages end in divorce. Where are we, church? Again, I'm not talking and saying these statistics to cause controversy or to hurt your feelings. I'm saying these statistics because I want us to be the example that's different. I want us to be the church that's going to take a stand and say that we will walk alongside the men and the women who are struggling. That we as spiritual leaders and as elders of the church will walk alongside those that are hurting and confused. That we as the church will walk alongside those young couples who are struggling in the first, second, third years of their marriage. That we will be the ones that stand up. That we will be the ones that teach our kids and train them up in the way that they should go. That we will be the ones that flee temptations. That we will be the ones that stand against the culture of compromise. Wow. Gallup.com says this. 
and I believe this is where a lot of these statistics are coming from. Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year. This is from 2021. Dropping below 50% for the first time in the Gallup's eight-decade trend. In 2020, 47% of Americans said that they belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. Down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. Where are we, church? What are we doing? Commandment number one, no other gods before me yet. Soccer, volleyball, baseball, camping, work, and anything else you want to put in there is coming first. And listen to me closely. You can have a relationship with God without going to church, but it makes it incredibly hard. That's not the way God designed it. How do we live a life, a godly life, when culture changes? I think the first, ver- the first church has explained this to us. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified to be the both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. First thing we need to do is repent. Ask for forgiveness. Turn towards God. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, generation to generation to generation to generation, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all the listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Did you hear that? This isn't new to us. We're not living in Babylon alone. We're living in Babylon with others. And here Peter is saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. If you hear anything today, repent, turn back to God and save yourself from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter had said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. Verse 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. We cannot expect culture to change if we as Christ followers are not living in the culture. We cannot expect culture to change and lives to be different if we ourselves are not holy and set apart. We are the example to the world. We are the light into the darkness. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ, our salvation, we're a different culture. And we will not bow down to culture of compromise. How do you live a godly life? You have strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. You stand up for the everlasting God. And you put God first and you obey his word. Church, we've got to do better. We're seeing people leave the faith because of our example. $12 billion. That's not kids, that's us as adults. 690-something thousand babies killed. That's not kids, that's people my age. Church, we've got to do better. We've got to take a stand. And we need to learn how to thrive in Babylon through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much. God, forgive us. Help us to turn back to you. Help us to put you first in everything that we do. Help us not to put any idols before you. Help us not to bow down to those golden statues. And maybe, Father, there's some sacred cows we need to tip. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Yes, it's heavy. These statistics hurt. My heart weeps. 
But Father, I believe revival is taking place here at Journey Ministries, and I believe revival will take place all over the world. People are understanding who you are in the Babylon that they're living in. They're seeing this culture of compromise. They're seeing this, this evil culture that's taking all around them. And I see men and women willing to take a stand. Help us to take a stand for the things that matter to you, God. Help us to throw off anything that hinders the temptations that we find ourselves in. And help us to fix our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith, the firm foundation on which we stand, and our shepherd, our leader, our guide. Holy Spirit, speak. You are the everlasting God, the beginning and the end. It's amazing to know how much you love us. Thank you. Help us to change our homes. Help us to be the men and the women, the moms and the dads that you've called us to be, to train up our children in the way that they should go, to have hard conversations in truth, but also in love. Help us to set the example and to stand up and to stand firm in the power of your name. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing, please? So good. Thank you, band. Hey, one of my uh, favorite couple verses in the Bible is actually from Daniel chapter 3. It says this, Daniel 3, verse 17, if, you thrown into the, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statues you have set up. It's time to destroy the idols we have in our life. Stand up. Be the church. And make a difference. Wow, so good, right? So good. Even if you do not, I will still serve you. Wow. Will you help us clean up the chairs, clean up the room? Be careful in the parking lot. No burnouts and donuts. And enjoy the week. <laughs>